Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, MHRC seminar this afternoon. I'm David Hood. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Brian Glancy from the Muscle Energetics Lab at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Tell you a little bit about where Brian's from. He's from California. He did his undergraduate degree at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. He then went to Arizona State in Tempe, Arizona and worked with Wayne Willis to do his master's and his PhD. And uh, that's where he gained his interest in mitochondria uh, and bioenergetics with Dr. Willis. And then in 2009, he moved to the NIH and uh, worked with Bob Balaban. Uh, and um, he was a postdoc there for seven years before he got his position now as an investigator uh, at the NIH, where he has his his own laboratory and his own research program. And we're really excited to hear about his topic today, which is sustaining power, building energy networks in striated muscles. Uh, Brian, if you would like, please turn on your camera and share your slides with us and we'll uh, get underway. All right, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Hood, for inviting me to give this uh, talk. Um, I'd say this is definitely one of the big uh, benefits of the pandemic has been the kind of emergence of some of these uh, very nice seminar series where we can get people from all over um, to come check these things out. So um, I appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. Um, so just get a little outline of what I'm going to talk about today. So I'll talk a little bit about um, how and why we assess mitochondrial and muscle subcellular structures. Um, I'll tell you some stories about two different observations related to um, our investigations into how mitochondria support muscle contraction. Um, and then at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how we're using fly genetics to learn how to control some of these uh, muscle cell structures. So for this group, uh, you probably don't need to hear this very much, but um, striated muscles uh, generate forces for uh, quite a few different purposes. Uh, one could be just moving heavy objects for short bursts of, of high power. Um, but also for sustained contractions over long periods of time. Um, and if you look at the heart, the, the role of the heart is obviously to, to pump blood throughout the body, and this happens all the time. And so while these uh, skeletal muscle examples are a bit extreme, um, these also um, can represent things that we do every day. So moving objects, whether you, know, you pick up a gallon of milk, short bursts, if you just get up out of your chair, um, this is something we're doing all the time, or sustained contractions. If you walk across your campus, for example, to your office, um, that's an example of that. And you know, everyone has a heart, hopefully, um, that's, that's beating. And so with these different uh, force demands come different energetic requirements. Um, and it's been a longstanding question in muscle biology and really in, in many different types of cell biology, um, but how, how do cells or how do muscle cells match energy supply to energy demand? And this process is known to go wrong or um, be off a little bit in many different diseases such as, or pathologies such as diabetes and aging and heart failure and things like that. Um, and so um, a big focus of my lab has been looking into how matching energy supply and demand um, works. Um, and looking in one aspect of this is um, in skeletal muscle cells and even in heart cells, these are relatively large, very big cells. Um, and so in order uh, with these changes in energy demand, it requires a very rapid distribution of energy across these big cells. Um, and so for anything that's longer than a minute or two um, in terms of uh, muscle contraction, mitochondria are going to be the primary source of, of ATP generation or ATP, the main energy currency of the cell. However, mitochondria can't work all by themselves um, within a cell. Um, they need to get oxygen from the capillaries. They need to get a fuel source from either lipid droplets or glycolytic enzymes. Um, in order to make ATP, they need the ATP precursors, ADP and phosphate, which then have to come from the different ATPases within the cell, whether it's the sodium potassium pump or the, the circa uh, part of the endo endoplasmic reticulum, or for muscle cells, the main source is the myosin ATPase. And so then once the mitochondria use all those things to make ATP, that ATP then needs to get back to the ATPases to be used uh, to, um, as chemical energy. And so, um, so while mitochondria have kind of been my uh, love and focus for my entire scientific career, um, I have to uh, appreciate that mitochondria can't work by themselves and they have to operate as part of a system and what we call the cellu cellular energy distribution system. And the way that uh, we look at the cellular energy distribution system or really any system is the functional capacity is a combination of the content of each of these different components, the protein and lipid composition of each of these different components, as well as the configuration. And so the content, we have a pretty good understanding of how changing content of any of these things affects function. If you put more mitochondria in a cell, 
generally you're going to have more mitochondrial capacity or energy conversion capacity. Uh, if you put more myosin filaments in, you're going to have generally greater contractile power. If you put more increased capillary density, you're going to have greater oxygen delivery capacity. And so we understand these things and we understand the regulators of, of over several, several of these processes as well. Uh, for protein and lipid composition, uh, we've learned a decent amount of this over the last couple of decades. Uh, you know, one mitochondria is not the same in every cell. Uh, a mitochondria in skeletal muscle and heart are relatively similar, but if you look at a mitochondria inside a, a kidney or a liver, for example, the protein composition is vastly different. One example would be in the liver, the oxidative phosphorylation enzyme content is, you know, one fifth or lower compared to skeletal muscle or heart mitochondria. So it's a very different type of mitochondria. Um, and we know some of the pathways that, that regulate the different, you know, processes within mitochondria in terms of the composition. But the part where I would say we know the least about is how the configuration, how do we change the organization of all these different parts and how does that affect function? And so this is kind of the area where we're spending a lot of our time, um, at least these days. And so to look at configuration, really what we have to do is look inside the cells. Um, there are biochemical fractionation methods, but really we need to be able to see inside the cells to see how the organization changes. And so I'm gonna talk a lot about 3D electron microscopy data today. And so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background on uh, how we do this. And so we use a technology called focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy, where we take uh, fixed muscle tissues um, it takes you know four or five days to fix and embed and dehydrate them and get them all ready um, to do any kind of imaging. But then once we have that, we dig a trench on the surface of the, the muscle tissue, and then we use a scanning electron microscope to generate a grayscale image that looks like this, where you can see these are mitochondria here. We can see sarcoplasmic reticulum. You can see a little bit of T-tubules. You can see the contractile apparatus, the myosin filaments, the Z-discs, the I-bands. And so we get an image like this, and then we take a second beam, an ion beam, and we cut off the top with a really thin um, layer, and then we image it again. And we do that over and over and over again. And so we get a series of images um, generally hundreds to thousands of images. And so we're now we're moving through the muscle and we get, you know, we can look at, you know, the 3D volume when we reconstruct this. And so this allows us to then make 3D reconstructions kind of like this one. Now we're looking at a newborn mouse muscle and we can see a lot of different things all at once. Um, we can see myosin filaments, we can see SR and T-tubule membranes, there's mitochondria we can see, we see big lipid droplets in these newborn mice. Um, we can see cell membranes. Uh, we'll see a nucleus come here at the end. And so what I hope you can appreciate, there's many, many different physical interactions that are happening within these cells. And when we're doing 3D electron microscopy, we can see all of these things. Uh, we don't see every single structure. We, we don't, for example, see actin filaments in our data sets, um, but we can see many, many different structures. And this allows us to take kind of an integrated viewpoint um, on a muscle cell structure. One of the uh, big problems with EM is because it's we don't have specific labels, like if you do light microscopy where you tag a GFP to a specific protein, we just have grayscale images. And so in order to actually study mitochondria, for example, in the past, what we had to do is we had to trace everything by hand. Um, and you can do that to affect, you know, as a postdoc, I spent hundreds of hours tracing uh, structures, but it's not very effect, um, not very efficient. And really, we're only we're looking at maybe, you know, 10% of the data. And so as I started my lab, what I wanted to do is take a more big data approach where we can take these big data sets of thousands of images, um, where tracing by hand is going to take thousands of hours that we don't have. And we instead we use machine learning where we just trace a little bit of the structures. And then we can use the machine learning programs. In this case, we use a program called Elastic. We can apply it to the entire data set. And you know, what it does is it allows us to impart color for each different structure. Um, but really what it allows us to do is what I call a, a virtual muscle cell dissection, um, where we can look at all the major muscle organelles individually. You can look at the mitochondria, sarcoplasmic reticulum, the lipid droplets, lysosomes, T-tubules. Um, we can even look at the different components of the sarcomere, um, where we have the Z-discs at the end. Um, we have the A band where the myosin filaments are contained. We have the middle of that, which is the H zone or the M line, which we can segment out sometimes. And then we can also segment out the I bands, which are the actin only containing regions. And this is, you know, can be up to 85% of the cell volume. So by pulling out all these different structures, what it allows us to do then is to um, look at the cellular energy distribution system across the different subcellular scales that it operates at. And for example, we can have some individual mitochondria. We can do many different types of analyses just on individual mitochondrial shape. Um, and structure. Um, we can look at individual sarcomeres, but both of these organelles are well known to organize into networks. Um, we're in the mitochondria. Um, we have many adjacent mitochondria. In this case, this is an oxidative muscle, so it forms this more kind of grid-like network where each color is a different mitochondrion. 
And you can see the kind of intricate network that has formed. Um, sarcomeres are also have long been known to arrange end-to-end -end in series to form myofibrils. I'll tell you a little bit more about that and how accurate this structure is here um, a little bit later. Um, we can look inter inside the organelles where we can look at the cristae and other different sub uh, mitochondrial structures. So I'm not going to talk about that at all really today. Um, but we, I will talk a little bit about the interior of the sarcomere and the myosin filament um, as we go on a little bit later. Um, a big focus of what we do and a, really what I think the power of this 3D imaging is, is really looking at interactions. Um, we can measure content and the amounts of things in a variety of different ways, but 3D, the 3D microscopy really allows us to look at the interactions among different structures. Um, and so here we have an example of a mitochondria in cyan, which is wrapped very tightly around by the magenta sarcoplasmic reticulum. We can see also the triad or the T-tubules um, here. Here we have a sarcomere, which is with the individual myosin filaments wrapped around by the SR mesh around it. You can see the mitochondria also surrounding this sarcomere and also a lipid droplet. So um, this is kind of the system that we're using to answer a lot of our questions. And so if we look, start looking at the mitochondria, it's been known for decades, thanks to work from you know, Skulichev and Weibel and Brooks and Ogata and others, that different muscle cell types have different mitochondrial network configurations. In glycolytic muscles, you have more thin, elongated mitochondria arranged primarily along the perpendicular axis of the muscle cell near the Z-disc. So each of these cells would contract along this axis, um, the parallel axis. And the glycolytic muscles have relatively low uh, content, can be low as 2-3% volume, and generally have uh, fast twitch myosin isoforms. Um, oxidative skeletal muscles have thicker mitochondria in this more branch configuration where you have parallel and perpendicular oriented mitochondria between the myofibrils and wrapped around the, near the Z-discs. Um, they have higher mitochondrial contents, about 10 to 15%, and this can happen with either fast or slow twitch uh, fiber types. And the heart, which I consider kind of an extreme muscle type, um, you have way more mitochondria, about 30% volume. So it's hard to see exactly where they are in this rendering, but they're arranged in parallel between the myofibrils. They don't branch in the perpendicular axis really at all. Um, they're thicker, much bigger mitochondria, but they're more compact. Um, and again, the heart is more of a slow um, type muscle. And so what we've been really into the last uh, couple of years is looking at how well the mitochondrial, these different mitochondrial network configurations support contractile activity. And really in a muscle cell whose jo main job is to generate force, this is the main role of a mitochondria in a skeletal muscle cell is to support contractile activity. And so what we wanted to do was then um, look at you know, how these different mitochondrial network configurations, the first thing we wanted to do at least was look at how these different mitochondrial network configurations support uh, the, the myofibrillar structure in these networks. And so this is just a cartoon from a textbook um, where you can see the kind of the individual myofibril structure that's, you know, was you know thought to at least uh, run kind of end to end um, for the most part. However, um, we started looking at these muscles and we can look kind of in different ways. And so depending on how we look at the muscle, uh, we can see slightly different things. If we look at the longitudinal view of the muscle, um, kind of from the top view, um, we can see different things. If we look from the cross-sectional view, we can see other things. And there's nothing specific you need to see here other than there's different way, how we look at the muscle kind of changes what we can see when we look through the raw data. And we spend, or at least I've spent, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours probably just looking through raw data just to see kind of what's there. Um, in these data sets. And this is what's kind of led to what I'm going to talk to you about. And so what we wanted to do to pull out all the individual myofibrils is we turn the muscle on its end and we're looking down the barrel of the muscle fiber and we can go through and we can kind of count all the different sarcomeres that are here. Um, and what you can notice is this is a slow twitch, sorry, fast twitch glycogen glycolytic fiber, or at least part of it here. And this is a slow twitch oxidative fiber. You can already notice the differences in mitochondrial content, um, but hopefully you can also notice the differences in shape between the myofibrils, the much more elongated and curved um, in, this, in these slow twitch muscles. And so what we wanted to do then was go through and kind of pull out all the individual myofibrils the way we had done previously with mitochondria. But when we did this, uh, we got kind of, at least for what was for me, coming from an outside, not a contractile background was a surprising result. Um, and so what I would, you know, I'm going to play a video here in a second. And what I advise you to do is just pick any one of these numbers and then follow the sarcomere and look at just how the shape changes as, I, as we go down uh, the muscle fiber. And so some of these are going to be colored because those are going to be the ones that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Um, but as we go through, what you can see is, you know, a lot of the sarcomeres or almost every single one is going to change shapes a little bit. Um, and they're going to get bigger and smaller and they're going to have a lot more changes than I would have uh, appreciated before doing any of this stuff. And so I'm going to take away the uh, kind of the other information and only show just these, uh, what was six sarcomeres at first. And then as we go down about 10 sarcomere lengths or so, um, by the end, we're going to have about 
you know, what looks like now 11 sarcomeres, even though this is all one completely connected structure. And so what we see is that, you know, the contractile apparatus, and this is a mouse um, ox, fast rich ox glycolytic muscles, excuse me, um, seems to form this very mesh-like branching structure of um, what we call the myofibular matrix. And we look closer, we thought, okay, well, maybe this is damage of some sort. But what we find is the Z discs are perfectly aligned and registered. There's no you know, instances of vernier displacement or any other signs of damage. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is in red and yellow here, there's no signs of swelling. I'm not showing the mitochondria, but the mitochondria look perfectly fine. Um, there's no signs of damage here. And so you know, we started to look more closely at this um, and we can see the different sarcomere branches here. Um, what we find is that there's kind of two different versions of, of branching. One is what we call a split, where you have one piece going along and then it splits into two um, subsequent pieces. And then also what we call a myofilament transfer, where you have two pieces going along, two myofibular segments, and then within one sarcomere, um, a very funny shaped sarcomere, but within one sarcomere, there's a transfer of myosin filament. So now this one is smaller and this one is bigger. Um, we see this in every mouse muscle that we've looked at um, across development, um, different fiber types. Um, we also, um, thanks to um, some published data sets from Luigi Ferrucci's lab, we can see this in human muscles as well. If this is human vast lateralis, we can see the nice branching uh, network. We see this in every human muscle we've looked at. In slow twitch muscles, there's so much branching that we can actually track a single uh, contractile network across the entire width of the cell, as is marked here in green. Um, these are the nuclei here. And so despite you know, every single mammalian muscle we could find um, having examples of sarcomere branching, um, it's not the same in every muscle type. It's, it's very uh, cell type specific, um, where if we look at newborn muscles or this early stage at you know, basically the day of birth, about 27% of the sarcomeres um, have some type of a branch. But then as the muscle grows at, you know, to two weeks of age, sarcomere branching actually goes way down. Um, and this is kind of contrary to uh, previous uh, hypotheses from Goldsfink, where with growth, growth is with the driver of this process. Our data actually argues against it where we see a decrease um, during you know, postnatal growth. And then with the very large growth from two weeks to fast twitch fibers, we see no change in the sarcomere branching frequency. Whereas conversely, the slow twitch muscles, um, which are much smaller, less power generating um, than fast twitch muscles have much more branching um, sarcomeres, more than 40% of the sarcomeres branch in slow twitch muscles. And then the heart, it's about you know just over 20%. And so these data just here show, you know, suggest that growth is not driving this process. Cell size, or at least bigger size, uh, isn't driving this process, and, and contractile power is not does not seem to be what's driving this process either. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we can see this across a lot of different mammalian uh, systems, whether it's in humans or even as small as uh, animals as shrews. Um, there's examples, thanks to data from uh, Goldsmink and others on fish and birds and frogs. And so this seems at least to be consistent across uh, vertebrate systems. Um, Peter Jahi, um, who is a postdoc in the lab, um, who we're working on a review, he's found examples now in crabs and I think even hydra he sent me earlier this week. And so this is, uh, seems to be common across many, many, many different species. Um, and the, the previous understanding, at least what we can gather from the literature and based on what the reviewers have, have also told us is the, you know, the pre prevailing thought was that a myofibril, when it's growing, gets too big and then it has to split. Um, and then it splits into two new myofibrils and then you still primarily will end up with the individual myofibrils that run end to end because any split splits completely and now you have two separate pieces. Um, but our data doesn't support that. And if we look at uh, a brand, you know, the earliest muscle fiber that we can find. So this is a, a newborn day one old mouse um, where we have a very, very small muscle fiber with still centrally located nu nuclei. So during development, the nuclei moved to the periphery. And so this is a really, really early stage of muscle development. Um, as we play the video, what you'll see is that even at this earliest stage, the entire cell is one completely connected contractile network. And so what this tells us based on all this data is that the unified myofibrillar matrix is actually the natural starting point. It's struck the natural structure of a skeletal muscle cell at the earliest stages of development. And this seems to be true across many, many species, not just mouse. Um, and so it kind of changes a little bit our, our view, or at least at least my view of, of how force transmission works in a um, skeletal muscle cell, where we've long known that force is transmitted along the longitudinal axis um, to the from the sarcomeres to the tendon. Um, and then about 40 years ago, um, it was discovered that force could also be transmitted uh, long or sorry, uh, laterally or transversely um, to the sarcolemma from the sarcolemma 
sarcomeres to the sarcolemma. And this has largely been attributed to cytoskeletal elements such as Desmond, um, though there hasn't really been direct evidence um, of that or really strong evidence um, yet. Um, so with the kind of new structure, the, the myofibrillar matrix structure, we still have force being transmitted, um, direct force is being transmitted longitudinally across the cell. Um, but now we also have a direct pathway for force to be transmitted uh, laterally across the cell as well. However, we still need the cytoskeletal elements to connect to the sarcolemma. So I think these two systems are likely to be operating um, synergistically rather than you know, one versus the other. Uh, one is acting you know, passively and one is acting on direct forces. Um, and I, uh, it's important to note that lateral force transmission, I said, was discovered about 40 years ago. Um, Sybil Street, I think, was really one of the first ones to make these measurements. Um, and as she published a single author paper um, where she proposed that cytoskeletal elements and myofibrillar networks um, both were working together to tr transmit these lateral forces. But for whatever whatever reason, the lateral force transmission part and the cytoskeletal elements part of that paper seem to be took off and have been heavily cited hundreds of times. The myofibrillar networks part of that paper has you know, almost gotten hardly any citations and has largely been ignored. And it's probably because the gold spink hypothesis of GOAT of growth driving uh, myofibril spreading is kind of what propagated through the literature. But I think uh, our data aligns more with what Civil Street proposed back for, you know, 40, so, 40 or so years ago. Um, so a second observation that we made uh, while we were doing these studies was that not only do the myofibrillar uh, my fibrils seem to form a, a singular network, but also the sarcomeres themselves didn't seem to be as linear as we, you know, as you know, my kind of naive contractile understanding um, was. And so we see these kind of peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs as we look at the sarcomeres here. And if we look at a, a 2D example of, of an EM image here, we can kind of see it more closely where the middle of the sarcomere is thicker than it is at the Z-disc. And again, this has been this was seen, you know, 40, 50 years ago by Goldspink and others. Um, but then I think um, people had kind of dismissed this as a, a fixation artifact, um, thinking that it was some kind of weird um, issue with fixation. But coming from an outsider viewpoint, I had a kind of a different view. And my thought was that in order for mitochondria to fit in here, you have to make space for them. And if you have, you know, these kind of relatively big mitochondria, um, you know, you would have, if you had linear sarcomeres, you'd have a bunch of empty space here. And so our hypothesis was that the mitochondria actually displace the sarcomeres and they have to coordinate their structures together. Um, so to explain this a little bit more, we can take this, what's a pretty good uh, 3D rendering uh, cartoon from Ramberg and Sergatane from, you know, 40 plus years ago, um, where you have the nice circular linear sarcomere and it's surrounded by, which is actually a very good uh, rendering of the, the sub the organelles that surround the sarcomere. We have the mesh-like sarcoplasmic reticulum in the middle of the sarcomere. We have the, the uh, triad with the T-tubules and the SR located here. And then we have mitochondria wrapping around near the I-bands here in the Z-disc. And then the Z-disc is wrapped around by um, another mesh-like SR network. And as a single sarcomere, everything looks fine. The kind of the issue becomes then when you put two sarcomeres together in parallel like this. Um, if you didn't have mitochondria here, you could put these two sarcomeres really tightly together and there wouldn't be any problem. The problem is now that we have these thick mitochondria here, if we maintain a linear sarcomere, now we have these gaps. We have a big gap here and we have this big gap here. And that seems pretty wasteful um, in terms of a, a, you know, a very space efficient cell like a muscle cell. And so if we look at you know, the Z-disc area, there are actually some gaps in the Z-discs where you have these SR doublets, um, where there's SR that wraps around this Z-disc and then also SR touching this sarcomere. And so there's different kind of SR uh, connectivity to each or individual SR connectivity to each sarcomere. However, in the middle of the sarcomere, and this is, these, you know, images have been shown for decades, really. Um, so this isn't really new. Um, but in the middle of the SR, there's only a single, you know, line of tubules. And so there's not this doublet that there is at the, at the Z-disc. And so if there was just a single SR here, rather than this cartoon, which has two, if you change the space by having more or less mitochondria, or bigger and smaller mitochondria, you're effectively changing the diffusion distances between the SR and the, and the contract apparatus, which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense space-wise uh, or functionally. And so we don't think that that's actually how it works. We think this is why the tapering has to be uh, possible. And so to look more closely at this, uh, we'll show you a kind of another more zoomed in raw data where we're gonna have one sarcomere right here, and we're gonna have another sarcomere right here, and we're gonna go down the barrel of the muscle fiber. And what I want you to pay attention to is how thick the organelles are between the two sarcomeres as we go down three sarcomeres in length. And so we're gonna start thick and then it's gonna get thin, and then it's gonna be thick, and then it's gonna get thin, and it's gonna change back and forth, back and forth. As we go down the whole thing, you can see all the nice myosin filaments. 
Um, and so when we look at this in 3D now, what we see is you know, where the thick organelles were, now we have these gaps in the sarcomere structure. And so these gaps, um, as you might suspect by still watching that video, that's where the mitochondria are located because you have to make space. And so um, now you can see the SR wrapped around. And so this was a mouse fast switch glycolytic muscle. And so we said, okay, let's look at some other muscle types to see you know, how um, is this always true. And so we looked at uh, Drosophila indirect flight muscle, which has been widely studied. And I'll tell you more about flies a little bit later. Um, but the direct indirect flight muscle has a ton of mitochondria, just like a heart. It has about you know, more than 30%, but they all run in the parallel axis. And we don't see any type of, of change in, in length or change in spacing really along the length of these Drosophila flight muscle um, sarcomeres. So we thought maybe this is a cell type specific thing. So what we did was we took 11 different muscle types um, and we segmented out the sarcomeres where we measured the cross-sectional area of the A bands and the Z discs for each and every one of these sheets essentially um, within, within the muscles. And we did this for all 11 muscle types where we did four Drosophila types. And I'll tell you more about the specifics of these later. We did some human muscles that we got from Luigi Ferrucci um, and then six different mouse muscle types, the heart, early postnatal or, or day of birth, two week old mouse muscles, and then three different uh, mature types. And what I hope you can appreciate from this graph is that there's uh, cell type specific differences in this cross-sectional area or heterogeneity, or, or in other words, the difference between the A-band diameter and the, um, the Z-disc diameter or cross-sectional area. And so what we noticed from this beyond just that there's cell type specific differences is the top six, um, all the data where the average is above 20%, the human, the fly leg, um, the late postnatal mouse and the three different uh, mature mouse muscles, all these muscles have a strong, a high proportion of mitochondria oriented in the perpendicular axis near the Z-discs. And so that became our next hypothesis was that it's not just how many mitochondria, but where the mitochondria are that is dictating this sarcomere shape heterogeneity. And so then to look at this, what we did is we segmented out the mitochondria networks from all these different muscles. Um, in this case, we're flying through a mouse slow twitch oxidative muscle and we took our mitochondrial segmentations and we further split this apart into the different regions of the mitochondrial network, where we highlighted the ones that were near the Z-disc um, to capture all the perpendicularly oriented mitochondria in blue, and then the ones that weren't near the Z-disc are captured in red. And so then we could approximate you know, the proportion of mitochondria that are located in the perpendicular axis versus the, the proportion that are in the parallel axis. And so when we made this measurement, and some, fortunately some of these images aren't showing, um, when we made this measurement where we could measure the relative amount of Z adjacent mitochondrial abundance compared to the total mitochondrial volume, we see a very strong linear relationship between where mitochondria are located and the, the sarcomere shape heterogeneity, where if there's more perpendicularly oriented mitochondria, there's a greater uh, shape heterogeneity. The Z disk is smaller relative to the A band cross sectional area. Um, conversely, if we look at individual mitochondria volume, we don't really see any kind of direct relationship at all. Um, the size of individual mitochondria are not, is not driving this measurement. Um, and if we look at the total amount of mitochondria in the cell, there's maybe a biphasic relationship, but there's no really direct relationship suggesting that the amount of mitochondria is driving this. Um, really, it's where the mitochondria are placed rather than how big or how many mitochondria are in the cell. Um, and so, like I said earlier, some of this was seen before and kind of a lot of it, some people have dismissed it as an artifact of fixation. And so we wanted to look close, more closely at this. Uh, when I was a postdoc, we published some paper using um, live cell super resolution microscopy showing that in our in vivo fixed um, EM images, there's no difference in the mitochondrial diameters between EM and live cells. So there's no fixation artifact, at least on the mitochondria um, seemingly. We wanted to apply this now to this uh, study. And so what we did is we did stead super resolution microscopy again, but now we took uh, cells that were genetically encoded with the mitochondria reporter. We can also do the same thing with dyes. Um, and then we use a live cell actin dye. In this case, it was SPI 555 fast act. It labels the actin ends um, in muscle cells. Um, where it labels the Z-discs and also the, the A-bands. And so we can see both the Z-disc and the A-bands with the same reporter. And what I hope you can appreciate is that we can see the spaces pretty well between where the Z-discs are. Um, however, at the A-bands, we can't really see the spaces very well. And so we can try to do the technical full width half measurement, or full width half max measurements to actually measure the sizes of things in fluorescence microscopy. And for the Z-discs, we see a nice drop in fluorescence sufficient below 50% that allows us to do this. However, in the A-bands, we can't. The, the fluorescence doesn't drop far enough to allow us to make actually uh, quantitative measurements. And so that, what that tells us 
is that there's more space here at the Z disk than there is at the A band. And that matches what our EM says. Um, these SR doublets can be within 100 to 300 nanometers in width, so easily within the 50 nanometer or so limits of SCAD resolution, whereas these SR singlets in the middle of the sarcomere are only 50 nanometers or less in size, and at some places there's actually no SR in between the sarcomeres. Um, and so this kind of matches up with the technical limitations of SCAD where we can't actually resolve the space in the A-band. Um, and so since we think this is actually a real you know, structural phenomenon and not artifacts of fixation, we wanted to look deeper into the sarcomere and see what's happening. If there's tapering of the sarcomere ends, what's happening to the myosin filaments um, within, within the sarcomere? We can't see actin filaments on our EM data set, so we're, we have to um, leave our analyses to just the myosin filaments. And so to do that, what we did is we segmented it out every single myosin filament essentially within our data sets. Alex Hall from Thermo Fisher really helped us to do this in a more reproducible manner. Um, and so by taking out every single filament in some data sets, we can get up to a million myosin filaments and thousands and thousands of sarcomeres. What we could then do is make measurements on every single myosin filament within our data sets. And so what we did is we wanted to measure the shape. And so to measure the shape, we, we came up with a, what we call a proxy measure for curvature where we fit every single myosin filament to a perfect line. Um, and then measured how much from that perfect line did the filament actually deviate um, from it. And so when we look at that measurement, our proxy measure for myosin curvature, what we can see where it's the more curved filaments are brighter or more white or yellow. What I hope you can appreciate is that the, the periphery of the, of the sarcomeres is where the brighter filaments are located, whereas the interior of the, of the sarcomeres, that's where there's kind of the darker or more blue filaments, suggesting that they're more linear in the middle of the sarcomere. And so we can zoom in a little bit and look at the actual individual filaments. Um, if we look at the middle, we see these nice, very linear myosin filaments. But however, at the end, now we start to see some curvature. And some of this curvature is going to be up as you know, 63 nanometers, which is more than the diameter of the filament plus the spacing to the next filament. Um, we can then you know, make quantitative measurements on these you know, tens of thousands, um, hundreds of thousands of filaments. So I can't show individual data points because there's too many. So we have these uh, violin plots where we show the median and the quartiles. And what you can see, we look at the deviation from linearity, which is our proxy measure for curvature. And we compare it for filaments that are within 100 nanometers of the sarcomere boundary compared to the ones that are in the middle or, or farther away from the sarcomere boundary. We see greater curvature in the peripheral filaments than we do in the interior of the, of the sarcomere. And this is true for both slow oxidative or flask vasculitic muscles. We are then interested in seeing um, you know, are, is it the same everywhere along the boundary of the sarcomere, or can we actually break it up into the different components that make up the boundary of the sarcomere? We have the SR and T tubules here in green, we have the mitochondria in red, and then we have the lipid droplets here in, um, in cyan. And indeed, what we find, sorry, I didn't include the, I don't have the significance markers here on this presentation, but the mitochondria, the myosin filaments near mitochondria or lipid droplets or the larger organelles have greater curvature than the ones that are near the smaller organelles. And so this fits very nicely with our space backing hypothesis where you have bigger organelles, it's going to take up more space and it's going to necessarily cause greater curvature of the myosin filaments. Um, we would really like to make some direct functional measurements of this, but unfortunately there's currently no way to measure sarcomeric function and definitely not subsarcomeric force production, at least not in intact cells um, that I'm aware of. And so in, to get a, a grip, some kind of a handle on the functional impact of this uh, shape heterogeneity within the sarcomeres, um, we talked to Ken Campbell who had the idea of uh, looking at uh, the lattice spacing within the muscles because uh, myofilament lattice spacing has been highly well-defined and linked to, to functional measures based on X-ray diffraction studies. Um, and so the, the myofilament lattice um, in muscles, so myosin forms a hexagonal lattice. So there's six filaments that surround every other myosin filament at distances from 35 to 50-ish nanometers, depending on conditions. And then there's a smaller lattice of actin filaments within there that's also hexagonal with six filaments um, that creates kind of the myofilament lattice spacing. And the spacing between actin and myosin dictates uh, how much, how likely the filaments are to interact with each other. It determines calcium kinetics and a number of other different um, functional measure or functional parameters. And very, very small changes in lattice spacing, you know, 2.5 nanometers um, change can cause up to 50% loss of force in this, you know, this is a modeling study, but even uh, direct functional measurements of one nanometer can have up to 20% change in, in force um, based on some work in, in other studies by Tom Irving and others. And so we think this is a 
if we can assess the loudest spacing, that can give us at least some good insight into you know fun potential functional changes in these muscles. And so to do this, what we did is we took all our myosin filaments um, and we assessed basically how far along the myosin filament is either from the filament centers or from the Z discs, which aren't shown in this picture. And what that allows us to do is then break up our myosin filaments where we could highlight just the centers, just the ends or just or different inter intermediate points. And then we can measure the lattice spacing. And so we measured the lattice spacing with a fast Fourier transform analysis where we have, these are you know, actual segmented filaments. We see the nice hexagonal um, array. If we do an FFT on a single sarcomere, we see nice six individual points, which represent the hexagonal array. The distance between these points and the center is the inverse of the myosin to myosin lattice spacing. Um, however, because we're doing this on much more than just a single sarcomere, we're doing this on whole data sets of many sarcomeres, which have slightly different orientations. Um, when we do it on, on the whole data set, we get these circles where the, you know, the distance between the circle and the center is the myosin lattice spacing. And so we did this for four different mouse muscles. And indeed, what we find is that the spacing is different between the, the middle of the sarcomere. There's greater spacing between the myosin filaments versus at the um, ends of the myosin filaments closer to the Z-disc, there's smaller lattice spacing. Um, and this is true um, for the late postnatal muscles, the fast glycolytic and slow oxidative muscles. Each of these have high proportions of perpendicularly oriented mitochondria. However, in the early postnatal, the newborn muscles where there's only really parallel oriented mitochondria, we don't really see this change um, across the, the length in terms of lattice spacing. And so we think this provides some good evidence that there are likely functional differences. However, we can't measure them yet. Um, we'll see you know, in the future what we can come up with. Um, again, I'll just uh, bring up kind of the um, fixation issue and, and address it head on. Um, we can compare our data, our lattice spacing measurements to the gold standard X-ray diffraction. Um, we found some data, you know, five different papers where they measured mouse live intact cell, fast twitch and slow twitch muscles where in blue, um, are the literature values and our values are in red. So we overlap right with the values. In green here are the fast pitch values in red are ours. Um, we're right in the, the literature values. So we think fixation is again, not the issue here. Um, our, our values are right within the, the physiological range. And so we think this is a, a real phenomenon. Um, the last part, I'll talk about this um, before switching gears a little bit is we wanna see if we can start to control this a little bit. Um, one way um, we did this is by actually what I would call a fixation mistake. Um, when fixation goes wrong, we can really tell because the mitochondria are the first things to change. Um, they swell all up and the crystal get kind of blown out and are gone. And we can easily see this in our data sets. And so in this data set, which is a mouse fastest lateralis or a fast twitch glycolytic muscle, um, about 25% of the mitochondria are kind of blown up like this and swollen. Whereas the other 75% have their kind of normal, thin, crystal look normal structure. And so we hypothesized that we can then test, measure the myosin filament curvature for the mitochondria that are near the swollen ones versus the thin ones and see if there's any differences. Um, and so if we, you know, if we can segment out the different uh, regions, um, we can measure the diameters. Of course, the swollen ones are you know, more than twice as big. And indeed, what we find is that the swollen mitochondria have greater myosin filament curvature than the normal thin mitochondria. So it provides at least some evidence that um, if we acutely increase the size of the mitochondria, the myosin filaments are going to um, be moved by some physical mechanism that we don't know yet, um, but they're at least going to have to make space to make room for the bigger mitochondria. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to talk to you for this last little bit, um, we have a little bit of time left, is I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're learning to control these systems. Everything I've shown you before is maybe a bunch of you know pretty spinning videos and things like that, but everything I've shown you really so far has been very descriptive or correlative information. And so we're, you know, we're trying to come up with systems in order to control these things and understand the mechanisms that guide them. Um, and so one common way that people do these types of studies or, or to do faster, more mechanistic studies is they go to cell culture. Um, however, for our questions where we're really interested in configuration, we can't really use cell culture. A myotube um, has you know, very jumbly mitochondria. Um, they don't really have defined contractile networks. There is some contractile networks in there, but there's not, you know, not this very defined contractile network that you see here. I mean, these are both videos. This one is also a video. There's nothing's happening over the 90 seconds because mitochondria don't really move very much in 90 seconds in an adult muscle. And so this model doesn't really work for us for our questions of looking at adult muscle configuration. And so what we turned to was the fly model um, where the Drosophila indirect fly muscle 
Um, and this is really thanks uh, in log large part to an idea from Hong Zhu, who's a, a colleague here at uh, NHLBI, who showed me an image of mitochondria like this. And it was kind of like, okay, there's the system. Um, flight muscles have been widely studied and their mitochondria for a variety of different questions um, throughout the, the muscle literature. Um, flight muscles have a muscle type that's called fibrillar muscles, where the, mu the myofibrillar the myofibrils run end to end, um, and the mitochondria are aligned in parallel, similar to the heart where there's more than 30% volume. Um, however, we wanted to look at the other muscles. We hypothesized that the other muscles would give us um, some different configurations. And so that's what we actually found. We looked at two different types of tubular muscles. In the flies, there's two contractile, main contractile types, fibrillar and tubular. And so tubular muscles are cross-strided, more like our muscles in mammalian systems. And so we looked at the jump muscle, which its name implies is for jumping. It's a more glycolytic muscle. And then we looked at the leg muscles, which are the legs used for walking and balancing and things like that. So they're a little more oxidative. Um, if we look at the mitochondrial networks, which before we started this, there were no images in the literature about this at all. Um, we find that the jump muscle has parallel mitochondrial networks similar to the heart, or sorry, similar to the flight muscle, but way less, much lower mitochondrial content. Um, conversely, in the legs, um, some of the leg muscles, the ones I'm going to focus on today, have these grid-like mitochondrial networks, which are very similar to the oxidative muscles that we see in the mouse or in mammalian systems. And so from this data, we can tell a couple things, um, at least what we conclude is you can change muscle fiber type from fibrillar to tubular in the fly without changing where the mitochondria are located. Um, the second thing you can do is you can keep the same muscle type and change where the mitochondrial networks are, where the, where the mitochondria are located. And so what this told us from the very start before doing any genetic manipulations um, was that the fly has systems in place where they can control the mitochondrial structure and the contractile type in different manners. Um, they may be related in a lot of ways, but they have sy independent systems. Um, so the first thing we did was kind of what everyone had told us to do when we were, you know, was first starting the lab was knock out all the, you know, the mitochondrial dynamics proteins and see what happens. And so we did that in the flies and, and we knock out mitochondrial division by knocking out DRP1. We could also knock out FIS1 and both of those make the mitochondria bigger um, as you would expect. Um, if we knock out mitochondrial fusion factor um, in, in flies, it's just MARF, which is the ortholog of both MFN1 and 2, um, the mitochondria get smaller, they're fragmented, and these flies can no longer fly. Um, we also knocked out Miro. I thought this one might actually work because this is the best well-described mitochondrial trafficking protein, um, at least in neurons. Um, and so we knocked that out. The mitochondria get kind of funny um, and they, the flies can't fly. But what you notice, I hope, is that where the mitochondria are located doesn't change in any of these uh, genetic knockdowns. The mitochondria are still arranged in the parallel axis. They don't change to the grid-like or perpendicularly oriented mitochondria. And so what this told us is that, you know, we can change mitochondrial size, but that doesn't necessarily change where the mitochondria are located in the muscle cells. And so what we decided then was to turn to a different system. Uh, we turned to this, uh, using the SOM, um, SPALT major or SOM, which is a gene that uh, Frank Schnorra had um, kind of, you know, not, uh, uh, he kind of published uh, in 2011, a paper showing that if you knock down SOM, it converted the uh, flight muscle fiber type from fibrillar muscles to tubular muscles, but they didn't have any information really on mitochondria in that paper. And so we, we hypothesized that by changing the fiber type to a tubular muscle, it was gonna change the mitochondrial network. And indeed that's what we showed. Um, Frank Schnorra has since last year, he published a paper, you know, 10 years later from his first one, showed similar results, um, showing that when you knock down SOM, you convert the flight muscles from fibrillar to tubular, and you convert the mitochondrial networks from parallel to more grid-like mitochondrial networks. And so we use this system uh, combined with the wild-type muscles. I didn't show you the SOM overexpression data, but it changes, we can use it to change contractile type. So we use this system of five different muscle types, which gave us different combinations of fibrillar and tubular, parallel or grid, and SOM expression um, based on the previous images that I showed you. And we did a proteomic screen. And so we, we got over 3,800 proteins. And the way that we uh, analyzed the screen was we, um, for each of these different um, fiber type um, factors, whether it's contractile type or mitochondrial network type or SOM expression, um, we looked at both positive and negative regulators. And so in terms of parallel positive regulators, the flight and the jump muscle should, in theory, have similar protein um, composition if it's an actual driver, because um, these are both parallel mitochondrial networks. The flight muscle should have greater uh, protein um, abundance compared to the leg muscles or walking muscles. The jump muscle should have greater protein abundance than the leg muscles, because these are pro these are parallel, these aren't. And then the flight muscle should have greater than the cell knockdown. And so we did all these comparisons and then looked for proteins that were the same um, 
in all in all four of the lists. And so we got three different proteins that were parallel positive. And we did the same analysis on the negative to look for negatively associated because sometimes things work by activation and sometimes they work by repression. And so we did both, both sides and we did it for every single one of these uh, um, different groups. And so in total, we got a total of 142 protein candidates um, to, to then do further screening with. Um, what we noticed with the SALM associated, there was 51 different proteins associated with SALM expression, um, but only one was positively associated. Um, and so this was uh, transcription factor H15. When we do muscle specific knockdown of H15, we change the mitochondrial or the contractile network to tubular muscles. However, um, we don't change the mitochondrial networks that remain parallel. And so if, effectively we change the flight muscle to a jump muscle phenotype. When we knock it down to the jump muscles, we convert uh, to, a, to a leg muscle phenotype. The tubular contractile type doesn't change, even though there may be some differences here, it's still tubular. Um, but however, the mitochondrial network becomes more grid-like in nature. Um, um, I'm gonna skip this for now, but basically what we showed is if we overexpress SOM, we can rescue the SOM def or overexpress H15, we can uh, rescue the H15, or sorry, we overexpress H15, we can, not, we can rescue the SOM knockdown defect. Um, I don't really have time to go through that, so I'm gonna skip that. Uh, we also identified another factor, cut, um, which um, regulates mitochondrial networks in the leg muscles, uh, where normally we have the grid-like mitochondrial networks in the leg. If we knock down cut, we get these more parallel uh, mitochondrial networks. And so I'm gonna, again, skip this next part just for the instance of time where we can uh, rescue the phenotype. And so show, kind of show you how we're using these fly systems to then go back to the observations I showed you earlier, um, where the flight muscles, again, like I said, are called fibular in nature. And they're called fibular because they're the only type of muscle that I, at least I know about that actually has the individual myofibrils that run end to end. Insect fibular muscles are the only ones that I know that do this. However, the majority of the muscles in the fly are tubular in nature and they're cross-threaded more like us. So we hypothesize that tubular muscles actually form myofibular networks. And indeed they do. The jump muscle has uh, myofibular networks. They're very low branching frequency. As you watch and see shape changes or color changes, that's an indicator of branching is occurring. Um, and the leg muscle, which is a more slow twitch, th there's a much higher branching frequency where only about 10% of the sarcomeres branch here, about 80% of the sarcomeres in the leg muscle branch. Um, and so we can use this fiber type specification pathway that uh, you know Schnorr has um, developed with SOM and vestigial and ladybird. Um, for Richard Cripps is, is um, added with ex extra dental and homothorax. The genes in parentheses are the uh, mammalian orthologs, many of which have been shown to be related to fiber type as well. Uh, we've added cut and H15 to the list list. And so just to summarize, uh, if we knock down SOM, it changes from flight to a leg muscle phenotype. And so indeed, um, I'm not showing the actual data, but um, we see an increase in branching. If we change the um, SOM knockdown flight muscles look a lot like the leg muscle in terms of the branching frequency. Um, conversely, when we knock down H15, it's kind of half steps. Um, the flight muscle becomes a jump muscle and the jump muscle becomes a leg muscle type phenotype. And indeed the jump muscle increases its branching frequency to level to the leg muscle um, when we knock down H15. However, we don't want to just come up with uh, you know, cell design changes. We don't want to just change cell type completely. We want to work our way down to actually the molecular machinery. And so we hypothesize that one way to do this was, would be to use our proteomic screen um, where we could filter it for proteins whose abundance correlated with the branching frequency that we that had measured and showed earlier, where the leg is greater than the jump, which is greater than the flight, and the SOM knockdown is greater than the flight. And so that gave us a, a handful of proteins, but the one that we found that seemed to work was uh, neurochondrin. Um, there wasn't really anything really known about neurochondrin in muscle previously, um, but what we found was that instead of converting muscle type, we still kind of maintained the circular tubular or fibular muscle type, but now we have these small little branches. Um, as we look at the EMs, you kind of see the same thing. We have this still nice circular uh, myofibrils, but now what you're going to see is these, these thin little branches that are going to go through and they're going to connect all the pieces together. And so while this video plays, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we've learned about neurochondrin. Uh, altering neurochondrin doesn't change cell type markers such as SOM or H15. There's still a lot of mitochondria oriented in the perpendicular axis. Um, Neurochondrin regulates sarcomere branching only during the myofibular assembly stage. With flies, we have very precise genetic control over timing. And what we found is only when we knock down neurochondrin during 24 to 48 hours after pupae formation or during the myofibular assembly stage, that's the only time where we see this structural phenotype and the flightless behavior. If we do it before or after, we don't see this change. Um, neurochondrin overexpression also causes sarcomere branching. So what that tells us is that neurochondrin serves to balance myofibril assembly.
Um, and, you know, the reviewer for this paper, reviewer number two, gave us a, a lot of help, um, referred us to a paper from 1989, which showed um, that if you knock down actin, or partially knock down actin, but not myosin, you can induce sarcomere branching as imaged by TEM. And conversely, if you knock down myosin, but not actin, you get the same thing. However, if you knock down actin and myosin together, then there's no sarcomere branching. Um, and so we looked at that as our hypothesis uh, for norochondrin. And indeed, that's similar to what we found. If we knock down norochondrin, actin expression goes down, but not myosin. So it seems to be that we're creating this actin-myosin imbalance. And that's our current hypothesis for how sarcomere branching occurs, though we still have to do a lot of work to get to the specific machinery and things that are, that are um, working on this. Um, and so just really quickly, the kind of the last data slide um, is going to show you how the kind of we applied the fly, um, our fly system back to this problem of the sarcomere shape heterogeneity and the, the myosin filament curvature. Um, we have the flight muscle and the jump muscle, which have the parallel mitochondrial networks, and they have very little myosin filament curvature. However, the leg, which has the perpendicular or grid-like mitochondrial networks, has much higher filament curvature, and consistent with the results from earlier. Um, if we change the flight muscle mitochondrial networks to more perpendicular or grid-like with SOM knockdown, or if we change the jump muscle mitochondrial networks to more grid-like with H15 knockdown, for both, we see an increase in myosin filament curvature um, relative to the wild type muscles, though not all the way to the level here. So we're starting to get some control over these systems um, using our fly models, and now trying to translate our fly models back to fly or mouse models. And so to summarize, um, the muscle contractile apparatus is, um, it's not a bunch of individual myofibrils, but rather it's a singular mesh-like myofibrillar network, um, which is linked across the entire length and width of the cell. Um, and flies have an on-off switch for this myofibrillar network connectivity um, that can be regulated by transcription factors such as SOM and H15, um, but also can be regulated by uh, neurochondrin, which seems to um, work through altering uh, myofibrillar assembly and balance. Um, I'll play this video as I do the last part of the summary. Um, sarcomere cross-sectional area can vary along its length. Um, it correlates not with how many mitochondria or how big the mitochondria are, but rather with where the mitochondria are in both flies, mice, and in human muscles. Um, this shape heterogeneity of the sarcomere um, occurs through curvature of, of the peripheral myosin filaments, not the ones in the middle. Um, and it's greater for the filaments that are near large organelles, such as mitochondria and lipid droplets. If we change the mitochondrial networks to more perpendicularly oriented mitochondria, we can increase the myosin filament curvature. Um, and then finally, if we acutely swell the mitochondria, we can also increase, um, increase uh, my myosin filament curvature consistent with our space backing hypothesis. Um, and so this shape heterogeneity within sarcomeres um, or within myofilaments um, likely results in, or results in different lattice spacing at different regions along the sarcomere. And that likely results in variable force production capacity, though we don't know exactly what's happening yet. Um, we need tools really to assess subsarcomeric forces in intact systems. Um, we're working on some ways to do this. And one way is we're trying to do some modeling. So right now we're recruiting a PhD student through a, a partnership program with University of Maryland. Um, so if, you're, if you know anybody who may be interested in modeling some of these uh, 3D structures, uh, please reach out to me. Um, I want to thank the, the current members of my lab, which are pictured here, particularly uh, Prasanna, who has been the kind of primary author on most of the work I showed today. He's on the job market. Um, I would su strongly suggest looking at, looking at him as a candidate. Um, and also our lab alumni, Peter Jahi, Yuho Kim, um, and Brad Willingham, as well as the core facilities and, and Alex Hall from Thermo Fisher. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Wow, Ryan, great, fantastic work and uh, such lovely imaging. I'm, you know, truly impressed with the scale of molecules that you can look at the number the sheer amounts of data that uh, that you can collect using these methods it's just uh, very very impressive I'm going to remind the audience that uh, we take questions through the Q&A so if you have a question please enter it in the Q&A box and uh, we'll be happy to uh, take take a few of those questions um, should so, I read the questions or will you read the questions or? No, or I'll do it. Answer? I'll, okay. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah, I've got a couple before. I'll let a couple of people uh, put their uh, put their questions in. I wondered if, you know, you, you said early on about the heart and mitochondria uh, being very different from the configuration of mitochondria in the heart being very different from that in, in skeletal muscle. And, you know, they are short. They don't branch. They, is that a... a structural constraint in the heart, do you think, that makes them not as mm -hmm. 
you know, reticulum like as in mm -hmm. as in skeletal muscle. What, do, what are your thoughts? There? So I think it in the heart, the for whatever the you know, however the decision is made, it's decided we can just devote a ton of volume to mitochondria. And so we can have these nice linear arrays. When you have the parallel arrays of mitochondria, you're effectively displacing the myofibril. You can't have a myofibril there, right? And so when you put those there, you're just choosing to put so many mitochondria that you're going to get rid of contractile apparatus there. Um, when you do these perpendicularly oriented mitochondria, that I think is you're trying to put mitochondria in by being as space efficient as, as, as possible. You're just kind of tapering the sarcomeres, but you're not, you know, just completely displacing them. And so I think when you only need a little bit of mitochondria, you go to that kind of perpendicularly oriented orientation because you don't have to completely get rid of myofibril contractile you know, cross-sectional area, but to start putting more. And so you move to the oxidative muscle with greater content. Now you start seeing more of these parallel arrays, not as much as the heart, but now you're starting to displace some contractile volume with mitochondria directly. And then you go to the heart and you just say, I need a ton of mitochondria. I don't need as much power. And so you just have these linear arrays and that's maybe the simpler way to do it. Um, but you have, you, you completely lose contractile uh, volume by doing it that way. Right, right, right. Okay, thank you. So first question, Michael Paris uh, says, although not currently measurable with your scanning EM techniques, do you believe the actin filaments are being curved similarly as the myosin filaments, i.e. outer filaments curve more? And if you believe this, this actin, this actin curvature does occur, would it mitigate some of the reduced myosin actin interaction probability and thus mitigate force losses of those outer filaments? So for the first part, I definitely think it's true with the actin filament. So this is uh, not our data. Can you still see my screen? Yep. Uh, yep. Okay. So this is uh, data that was published in Cell last year where they did cryo-EM, uh, cryo-electrotomography on non-fixed, or at least not chemically fixed, mouse psoas muscle. Um, and so the, here you can see the actin filaments on these data sets, and as well as the myosin filaments. They're maybe at a longer sarcomere length than we were. Uh, but you can see curvature of the, of the actin filaments um, here because they have the, the resolution to do it. They didn't talk about this in this paper um, at all, but you, I, you know, I can see with my eyes at least that there's curvature of the actin filaments as well as the myosin filaments. And um, so I think definitely that the, the actin filaments also are gonna be curved and it's, it's gonna depend on sarcomere length somewhat. We didn't, we, we didn't do a specific study on that and our just making random sarcomere length measurements didn't tell us anything. Um, so I think that needs to be worked out more. Um, the second part of the question was, uh, would it mitigate some of the reduced uh, probability. Um, I think as long as the actin filaments stay interdigitated between the, the myosin filaments, and, and I, you know, I will just say again, I'm not a contractile expert. I'm you know trying to get into this a little bit. Um, so I think as long as the actin filaments stay evenly spaced between the, the myosin filaments, that is, if the filaments are closer together, it's going to change the probability similarly, you know, um, whether it's, even if it's act, actin is curved as well. Right, right, right. Okay, next question. Richard Lieber asks, can you talk about your lateral force stabilization mechanism? There are modeling papers that argue that this lateral force is critical to maintain homogeneous sarcomere lengths. I think that's true. So force, so I, I'm not exactly sure about what, uh, which part uh, you're talking about. So you're just talking about um, just the lateral transmission of force. Yeah. Um, um, and so, I mean, we, you know, other than the actual structure of the sarcomeres, we don't have a specific, you know, mechanism and we haven't directly measured the lateral force in these muscles. Um, and so yeah. I would say that, you know, there's modeling papers that this lateral force is critical to maintain homogeneous sarcomere lengths. I would imagine that that's true um, based on our data. I, this doesn't seem, the branching of the sarcomeres doesn't seem to affect the registration in the lateral axis. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to go way back on the on the talk, but you know, when I show the one with the Z discs are all still nice and register, um, even with all the branching that's happening. So I think the stabilization is is probably still there. I don't know that uh, those papers that you're talking about, but I would gather that the sarcomere branching doesn't necessarily affect any kind of lateral registration or stability. But um, I, I don't I don't know for sure. Okay. Chris Donnelly asks, uh, says, fabulous talk, Dr. Glancy. What do your structural data mean for ex vivo measurements of mitochondrial function? Example, respiratory capacity in isolated mitochondria. Um, I mean, it's, you know, I would say that, you know, it's the same. I mean, 
I would say my data hasn't changed any of any of the interpretations because uh, I remember when I was a grad student and only doing isolated mitochondrial work, I would go to meetings and, and George Brooks would always get up and say the mitochondrial reticulum, you know, how does that you know, affect things? And and so, um, you know, I guess I would say my data hasn't changed that because we haven't you know changed the fact that it's reticulum. Maybe we have you know, nicer pictures um, and so maybe more people can see it. But um, that's been known for a long time. And so it's always been a. Uh, one of the concerns of isolated mitochondria is that you're taking them out and you're gonna, when you isolate them, they turn into the spheres. And so they're no longer connected. They don't have all the other configuration and connectivities that uh, happen in the cell. And so you're trying to recapitulate those by providing substrates and providing the ATP you know, precursors and things like that. Um, and so it's, it's still very useful for looking at uh, respiratory capacities, but it, you, you know, for some things, you still need to go back to the cells and the intact systems permeabilized fibers can overcome some of those problems, maybe add different problems. Um, you go to intact cell systems, now you can't measure as many things. And so it's, it's a trade-off. So you just have to you know, understand the limitations of, of the different systems, the benefits and advantages um, and, and disadvantages yeah. of each one really. Um, okay, uh, next two questions are very sim uh, similar. Fabio Sarto and Rolando Sedia mm -hmm. are asking about mm -hmm. chronic exercise uh, and endurance training, and do you think that'll impact sarcomere branching? Um, yeah. You know, so, yeah. Yeah. So, without giving away anything uh, that I guess I didn't ask for permission to share today, I'll say the answer is yes. Um, if you were at the the Baltimore uh, meeting, uh, integrative physiology of exercise, you might have seen some data on that. Um, and, and a poster um, from the lab, but uh, I didn't get permission. It's a, through a collaboration, so I, I'm supposed to get permission to talk about that stuff. Um, but the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Good. And what about uh, a disease model? You, you know, the mitochondrial swelling that you artificially created there and altered the altered the, the curvature and stuff like that. I wonder, would it be of interest to, to look at muscle fibers from mitochondrial DNA disease patients that have ragged red fibers and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. would, would that be of interest to, to look at, you know, how the sarcomeres are arranged? Mm -hmm. Given the yeah, I mean, I imagine, I imagine that there would be, you know, more or less branching. I guess you'd have to have control, you know, the right controls to compare it to. I know that uh, Martin Picard and Amy Vincent published a paper, 2019, I think, um, where they were doing 3DM to look at the mitochondria um, in mitochondrial DNA patients, I believe, and they published some some raw data videos, and we used one of those videos to, to measure sarcomere branching in human muscles. Before we got Luigi Ferrucci gave us some actual raw data sets that we can analyze ourselves. Um, we used we were using that data, and there is sarcomere branching in those in the videos that are online. Um, and it was I think 14% of the sarcomeres branched in the ones that we looked at um, from their paper, but there weren't control videos to compare it to. So I, I don't know whether that's higher or lower, um, but it happens. I just don't know how it compares to other uh, other cell types or, or controls, I guess. Right, right. Now, I uh, have two more questions. Uh, okay, we'll go to Chris Perry. Kirkwood and Brooks showed mitochondrial reticulum lengthened after endurance training in rats. Have you re-examined this question with your methodology? I guess that relates to the earlier question, doesn't it? Yeah, we're we're working on that right now. Heli Perry in the lab is um, is is looking at the mitochondrial side. Peter Ajay is looking at the contractile side. Um, so uh, we're we're working on that right now uh, with a uh, endurance training model and disease. Um, right. So the curvature, you know, uh, the curvature must have implications physiologically, right? You 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 mentioned that force generation would probably be impacted, maybe calcium kinetics. Is that, uh, is that where we're going with the implications mm -hmm. of this the curvature that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's really an instance where the structural resolution is way higher than the force resolution. And because of you know, the way that we're looking at it is we can't just take sarcomeres or myofibrils out because we need the organelles to be there intact to, you know, I don't know, if you take the organelles out and you just have isolated myofibrils, I don't know whether this curvature stays or not. I guess that's an experiment that we should probably check to see if it is maintained when you take out the organelles. Because really, I don't think it's, I, I, my hypothesis is not that it's the organelles pushing on the sarcomeres, that there's probably a cytoskeletal element in there that is coordinating this. I don't know what it is yet. Um, and so that's kind of where we're going with this is trying to develop ways to measure forces at smaller levels. Um, you know, we need to get those things up and going. And it's a very, uh, you know, not 
been our historical expertise, um, but some of the things that we've done to make mitochondrial measurements with subcellular resolution, we can try to apply some of those types of approaches towards uh, force production, but it's, uh, you know, we have to get that off the ground and get it going a little bit better. Right. I think, uh, and this, this question is going to seem kind of random, but I, I am not a, uh, an electron microscopy expert, but I've become interested in two organelles in muscle that are clearly there, but we never see them in EM pictures. And those are lysosomes and ER. So do you- ER versus SR, is that what you mean? Yeah. Like, like rough ER? Uh, yeah, like rough ER, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or, mm -hmm. or lysosomes. Uh, so in your images, do you see ER in any way, endoplasmic reticulum as opposed to sarcoplasmic yeah. reticulum? And do you see lysosomes? So we, we do see lysosomes. Um, we were doing some collaboration with uh, Dale Abel and AJ Hinton, um, and they were interested in lysosomes and they asked, can you see lysosomes? And so then I was like, so then I, I didn't know that I was seeing lysosomes. So then I looked closer and then I was like, okay, there are, there are some lysosomes. Um, we haven't done any real quantitative studies on them yet, but we can see lysosomes. They localize in similar places to lipid droplets, kind of right adjacent to the mitochondria. Um, they're similar size-ish to lipid droplets, at least inactive. Uh, you know, once they start getting involved in mitophagy and things like that, then they can look all kinds of crazy ways. But um, yeah. they're, they're, they are there. Um, and ER, um, in terms of rough ER in the mature muscles, we don't really see I don't notice it like the ribosomes. We would see it in the development. I can see what it looks like ribosomes on the ER. And that's when the rough ER is still supposed to be, you know, uh, around in skeletal muscles. But then I think, at least from what I read, is that it kind of goes away in mature muscles. It might still be there in low amounts, but maybe not enough that I see it by EM. Um, yeah. Molecular specificity, you know, maybe if I had some kind of specific stain, maybe we could see it, but yeah. not, I don't notice it structurally. Yeah, but you measure, we can measure all kinds of ER related proteins when we do Western blotting and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So I guess there must be something there or the SR has taken over the role of the ER in, in muscle, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. if that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the thought. I mean, that, yeah, I haven't really yeah. gone into that too much, but yeah. No, no, I know. I, I'm just asking you because you're an EM expert. Okay, folks, uh, I think it's time that we let, uh, Brian, go. We've, we're over time now, and we've asked him lots of excellent questions. And I think if uh, if there are more questions, we can maybe mm -hmm. Brian would be willing to answer them by by email. Um, yeah, yeah. I think anyway. there's two more from Chris and Chris. Just email me um, or send me a message on Twitter or something. Um, yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. So uh, let's thank Brian very much for this wonderful presentation. I want to thank you, Brian, for just stay with me for a minute, will you, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Folks, the seminar is over. We'll look forward to seeing you again next time in a few weeks for the next MHRC seminar. Thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, yep. Thank see you. See you next time. Okay, Brian, just stay with me.